Cape Talk. The world of science with Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist. Good morning, Chris. How are you today? I'm in very good shape, actually. And this is a momentous day, isn't it? Because we're in the big build-up of, of the Apollo 50th. And so, you know, I've been thinking all about that this week. Oh, tell me more. Well, of course, it's 50 years. This, this week is when the mission took off from the U- United States. And this oh, was the wow. first time anyone had ever walked on the moon. And right. it's, it's all happening this week. So everyone's very excited. That's a very good point. Um, what Will there be anything happening at NASA? There's a huge amount happening, yeah. So all around the world, people are making documentaries. There's enormous amounts of archive because we're into this very interesting era now where Mm -hmm. big anniversaries like 50ths and 100ths are coming along. But actually, we've got decent quality media that we can dip into. If you you go back five decades, there's very good radio footage, there's television footage and so on. And so you can make very rich documentaries today, which... Previously, we would have had to had some historians sort of talking earnestly and saying what they thought someone was saying or thought they, they felt someone was trying to portray at the time. Now we can actually see the people who did this saying what they think. And, and some of them are still alive, of course, which is also wonderful because yes. you can get the people who were the ground teams who helped to put this small group of people, because behind that small group of people who first went to the moon was an enormous army of people working to make that yes. mission a success. But So you've got the perspectives of both. And, and it is a momentous thing because the, what they achieved with so little to do that and to, and to come back and do it safely was, was nothing short of miraculous, really. Incredible. And the Google Doodle has got this most awesome um, sort of narrative with one of the, with one of the um, astronauts. I know you're science-y and all at the top there, but me, I, I go to Google Doodles. <laughs> <laughs> one of our listeners has actually said, I remember listening to the moon landing on the radio, and this was well before TV had even come to South Africa. Well, I um, was um, I was very fortunate because I, I was talking to John Anderson, who's the singer for the group mm. Yes, progressive rock group, and yes. uh, he said to me, "Well, actually, the moon landings were poignant for him because he'd gone with Yes to play a gig in Ireland." And unfortunately, another band had turned up and you can tell it was the 1960s because there was only one plug socket in the venue and the Bonzo Dog Doodah (laughs) band had turned up to play their gig and they'd rigged up before Yes got there and there was no other power supply. So he said, well, you know, we had to go to the pub. So we went to the pub and we watched the moon landings. And it's an amazing time to be alive. (laughs) That's incredible. So it says, um, I'm looking this up, it took 400,000 people. You said how many, you took, you know, armies, 400,000 engineers and scientists to get them to the room, to the moon. That's right. And billions, billions. The price tag was huge. Indeed. We've got a question here for you saying, I had Bell's palsy a few years back and have since found that my left and right eye pupil don't focus on an object at the same time. There's a slight delay. Does that virus cause nerve damage? First of all, what's Bell's palsy? Well, Bell's palsy is when the facial nerve, which is the nerve that supplies the muscles of facial expression, is paralysed. And this can happen for a number of reasons, the most common being what we call idiopathic. Sometimes it just happens and we don't get an established diagnosis. But the second most common cause is a viral infection. And our old friend the herpes viruses are probably a leading culprit here. What happens is that the virus reactivates, which uh, it's a virus that normally lives in sensory nerve cells, but it can reactivate and, and cause cold sores. And if it's the chickenpox virus, it causes shingles. And when it does that in the skin, it can get into the motor nerves that supply muscles as well and we think that the inflammation that ensues from that causes the nerve either temporarily or sometimes permanently to deactivate or or in some cases to to die and the consequence is that the input of that nerve to the muscles that uh, are used to move the face is lost and as a result people get an immobile half of their face so their face tends to droop their mouth might droop on that side if you ask people to smile one side of their face will smile quite well the other side they may struggle this can also lead to problems with speech for example and because some of your opening of your eyes is partly down to those muscles of facial expression and screwing up your eyes people find their eyes don't don't quite open and close as well as they would like they might get a droopy eyelid for example The pupils are controlled slightly differently. They are controlled by uh, a different set of nerves, which shouldn't be affected by this. So why that person's got that, I'm not entirely sure. But what we do know is that in some people it is thankfully temporary and it does you do get a return to normal function in the vast majority of people, but not in everybody. And, and a Bell's palsy should not be muddled up with a stroke 
because if someone has a, a problem with the blood supply in their brain affecting obviously the same territory in the brain it can manifest as a drooping face but if it is a stroke this is a medical emergency and you absolutely need to get to help quickly okay appreciate that um arthur and claremont wants to know what is an itch well, itching is where you have irritation on the skin. The fancy medical word is pruritus. And it occurs because there's a certain population of nerve fibres in the skin which specifically and selectively convey the sensation of itch. So the way that your nervous system works is that your body is divided up into almost like a map. There are different counties, if you like. And these counties or territories are supplied by groups of nerves and they feed back to the spinal cord and they say there is stimulus arising from this bit of the body. And there are groups of nerve cells that tell you you're being hurt in that area. There are groups of nerve cells that tell you you're being struck, stroked or touched or how warm or cold it is in that area. And there is an additional group of selective nerve fibres that say whether or not irritation is happening there. And they feed back this signal to the spinal cord so you have this integration in the spinal cord saying on this patch of the body we've got information about itchiness and also the temperature and exactly where those sensations are arising. Why they happen happens for a range of reasons. Usually that this is a defence mechanism. The body's evolved to have itching because it's there to detect when something might be trying to burrow through your skin because usually things that get into right. you like mosquitoes worms and so on they go through your skin and they tri trigger all of these biochemical tripwires and those mm -hmm. biochemical tripwires release chemicals locally into the skin and those chemicals cause the itch sensation and the most common cause of that is histamine which comes out of mast cells and that's why an yeah. antihistamine can make your skin less itchy gotcha why are blue eyes more sensitive to light are they well, what do blue eyes tend to go along with? Blue eyes tend to go along with a paler complexion. And this is because there's seven or eight genes which are involved in the coloration of the eye. And those genes add to the iris, which is the coloured bit of your eye, pigment. The natural colour of the eye is blue. And so if you take the base colour, which is blue, and add pigment to it, they always go a darker colour. So people who have a darker skin hue tend to have eyes which are not blue. People who have paler skin, and especially people from, say, Scotland, Ireland, who have ginger hair, they tend to have bluer eyes because they are depigmented. They have less level, lower levels of pigment. Now, um, in terms of whether or not your eyes are more sensitive to light because they're blue, that's not necessarily true because the sensitive bit of the eye is the retina, which is behind the pupil right. at the back of the eye, and the pupil opens and closes to admit or restrict more or less light accordingly. And so actually, I don't think the colour of the eye makes so much difference. The sensitivity is going to be to the whole body because if you've got more melanin in your skin, you have much better defences against ultraviolet rays, which is the bit of the sun that can burn you. Gotcha. Ian and Bloomberg, good morning. What's your question for Chris? Hi there. Um, great program as always. Thank you. I would. It's a bit, a bit of a basic question, but I'm sure people might want to have it cleared up by somebody like Chris. Um, eating wheat is it really a concern? Uh, that's a great question. Hello, Ian. Let's let's finish it once and for mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Well, what is wheat? Wheat is a cereal. As such, it's got lots of starch in it. And the reason that we eat wheat, we've bred these cereals over a few thousand years from ancestral grass type varieties to have these nice big seed heads on them that are very starch rich. We grind that up. Out of it comes the starch that we use to make flour. There are other things in there, including glutens. These make uh, it possible to do great baking with your wheat and make nice bread and things. But not everyone responds well to them. Some people ha are, are uh, allergic to this. They have celiac disease. And we mentioned the country Ireland the other day. There's a very high fraction of people, particularly in Galway in Ireland, one part of Ireland, where they have a high rate of the disease, celiac disease. And this is where you have an immune response to gliadin, which is the, one of the parts of gluten. So when you eat the wheat, the immune system regards this not as an innocuous food stuff, but it regards it as something bad. So it attacks it. And because this is constantly being presented to the wall of your intestine, because these things are so universal in what we tend to eat as a normal diet, that it causes inflammation and you end up ironing out the surface of your intestine. So you lose all of the ridges and folds, which gives it a very big surface area. So you don't absorb calories so well. So people often are prone to getting a lot of weight loss. They may become deficient in some vitamins. Luckily, it's easy to reverse that because if you're in that position, and this is a very tiny number of the population, you know, 
single numbers of percent who suffer with this, so it's not common. But luckily, if you have this, it's relatively easy to diagnose. And although the, the food may not taste as great without gluten in it, if you go for a gluten-free diet, then you can reduce all the symptoms and you have no problems with your health after that. So the bottom line is, wheat is great. It's been selectively bred from ancestral grasses to give us a really rich source of starch. It makes great bread if you have the right hard flour to make bread with. But if you're in the tiny minority of people who, for genetic and other reasons, have an intolerance of some of the proteins in this, then it can be a problem for you, but it's easily solved by avoiding it. Fantastic. Good for you, Ian. Yeah, thank you very much. That that kind of sums it up. So the, there's a lot of literature and people out there that are absolutely condemning it, though. Mm. Um, you know, so am I to just ignore that? I know because when you say a tiny percentage of the population, um, be these people are advo- yeah, that are intolerant. These people are advocating that wheat is not even a nutritionist. It's it's actually not a food. It's not a. It's more toxic than it is good. So is that nonsense in summary? Ian, thank you. Well, the the bottom line is that the vast majority of people have no problems with these foodstuffs at all. There are 7.5 billion people on Earth. Rice sustains a very large number of them, but wheat and other cereal products sustain a very large number of those people as well. And most people's uh, digestive systems cope with these things perfectly. But there is a tiny minority who don't. And in those people, it's easy to diagnose, it's easy to manage by avoiding the thing that causes the problem. You know, if, if you're someone who's prone to, say, hay fever then you don't go out in a field and get exposed to pollen. You can reduce your symptoms that way. It doesn't mean that pollen is toxic for everybody. So you have to be very careful about generalisations with this sort of thing. It's all down to the individual. And if someone has a problem with a food stuff, they should just avoid it. But there's an enormous amount of misinformation in this space, which I think you've alluded to yourself. Very large amounts of inflammatory misinformation. And uh, you know there, there, are, there are enormous numbers of people who go around diagnosing themselves with uh, eating disorders and food intolerance tolerances. And this probably isn't true. The number of people with a real defined medical problem related to certain foodstuffs is in single numbers of percent. And those people can be properly diagnosed and properly managed, but the vast majority do not have a food problem. They've usually got a problem with something else. Often it's, for instance, a psychological problem, which is manifesting mm-hmm. as an upset tummy. And they ascribe the problem to a food cause, but actually it's, it's a psychological manifestation or it, it's, a, it's a sort of abdominal manifestation of, of psychological distress. Yeah, I mean, I think the business of peddling um, extreme science, scientific conjecture about food is a business that goes, you know, that's done very well for many people for ages. It's a big industry. Ingrid and Bloberg, how are you? Hi, um, I couldn't hear the last part of that comment, so it might relate to the question I have. But um, I'm definitely not allergic to wheat. I mean, I grew up eating the stuff. I never had any bad uh, um, side effects. But later in my life, sort of in my 40s, I started noticing that I would swell. I would bloat after eating wheat. And uh, so, so I definitely not don't have celiac disease, but I definitely have a reaction to wheat, which has developed over time. So how, how do you explain that? Hello, Ingrid. There's a couple of things to bear in mind here. And one of them is that just because you don't have an allergy or an intolerance early in life doesn't mean that you can't acquire one later in life. And I was talking to Pamela Ewan the other day. She's an allergy specialist at Cambridge University. And we we were discussing the fact that some people say, well, my allergies get better as I get older. And she said they get equal numbers of people in their clinic who actually present with an allergy for the first time in their life when they're older, having never had an allergy. So it, it can go in both directions. So that's part of it. The other thing not to forget is that the environment in the intestine is not static. The intestine is populated by billions of microorganisms and the population of those microorganisms is controlled by a range of different factors. One of them is what you eat. So if you feed your microbiome, which is the name for this collection or assemblage of bacteria, a certain diet, then you will select out and enrich for some microbes and not others. And that population spectrum is really important for the... uh, overall health of the body, how you deal with food and the sorts of calories you extract from your diet. Certain foodstuffs will therefore select for certain and enrich certain bacteria over others. And because the microbiome can wax and wane in this way, 
depending upon what you're eating and other health problems and exposure to things like antibiotics, you can shift the spectrum of bacteria around and this in turn affects how you handle certain foodstuffs. So some of the symptoms, for example, of IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome that some people suffer with, can be because of an upset microbiome and if you repair the microbiome by shifting the diet and adjusting what you eat for a while to get it to go back to what is normal for you sometimes these symptoms can be improved so it's not just a question of of the body reacting sometimes it can be the microbes reacting against the overall dietary milieu Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for your question. Um, moving, well, it seems like we're still near bread and toast. One, this listener says, I'm one of those people who loves to eat the bits that are crispier than normal. Um, the charred edges of roasted food and crispy toast, are those carcinogenic? Probably, but they taste fantastic, don't they? I'm with you, whoever you are. Uh, the reason we like this so much, actually the chemistry behind this, there are several things going on. One is that these foodstuffs contain sugars, and those sugars, when you heat them up, caramelise, and this is where the sugar molecules bond together and you get sort of polymer of sugars. And those caramels, these big molecules, have a particular taste. They, they trigger particular taste receptors in our mouths and in our nose, and we like that. There's also a piece of chemistry called the Maillard reaction, after Louis uh, Camille Maillard, who is a Parisian chemist, I think he was working in the 1800s. And he discovered that when you heat food to more than about 150 degrees C, you get a reaction, now known as the Maillard reaction, between the amino acids in proteins and carbohydrates, the glucoses and sugars, which are on the surfaces of of foods. And this produces a brown-coloured material, and these Maillard products taste fantastic. Now, why have we evolved to like that? Well, there could be a range of reasons why we've evolved to like that. The one way, one compelling argument is that if they're present, the food must have been heated to a high temperature. If the food's been heated to a high temperature, ergo, it probably will not be infectious because any microorganisms are likely to have been killed. So there may be an evolutionary argument for why we've evolved to like these flavours because perhaps they favour our uh, diet. They, they, they are better for us because we're less likely to pick up infection. That might be one reason. Also, cooking certain foodstuffs helps to liberate more calories from it, making it more energy dense. Therefore, if we eat it, we're going to do better than if we don't cook it. So it may be that we've evolved to to cook certain foodstuffs and, and favour cooked foodstuffs because ultimately it delivers more calories and that means we're, we're less likely to go hungry. Cape Talk, the world of science with Dr. Chris Smith, the naked scientist. James in Simonstown, you um, are asking about Tourette's. Hello there. The great neurologist Oliver Sacks, a well-known writer, said that a friend of his a surgeon, a very responsible person, had Tourette's syndrome, which caused him to drive his car like a racing driver. Uh, can I use that as an excuse, uh, an unspeeding fine? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've read that particular reference. I think it's in The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, isn't it? Uh, and he talks that's, about that's the fact right, that yes. there's this gentleman who has the most intrusive Tourette syndrome. And I think that that surgeon was also a pilot. Am I right? And and, and and Oliver Sacks went for a flight with him. And he said initially he was alarmed to be thinking, I'm taking to the air in a small aeroplane with this gentleman. And actually he said that as soon as he started flying, and just like when he was operating, his movements became extremely fluid and that there was no problem. For people not in the know, what is Tourette's? Tourette's is a tick disease. Tick means where people have intrusive movements, which can include vocalisations or expressions, that kind of thing, over which they have little control. And they tend to increase when you concentrate or worry about them, and they go away when you go to sleep or when you don't focus on them. And when people make purposeful movements, they can be surmounted. So they don't tend to intrude on or affect when you're actually doing something you intend to do. They tend to occur, these movements, and they can be very subtle. And just just as much as a flickering of an eye, for example, they tend to occur, and most people probably back me up on this, when you are not doing something with that body part or when it's not going to affect the outcome. So no one really understands exactly what's causing this, but we know it's centred on a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And these are the regions of the brain that are coordinating movements and, and how we plan and execute movements. Now, 
your choice about how fast you put your foot down in your car is very much a volitional one. And just like Oliver Sacks's friend flying his aeroplane, and he's very good at doing that, I don't think the police are going to believe you if you then turn around and say, I'm sorry, my Tourette's made me keep my foot on the accelerator all the way to the floor, all the way from Joburg to Cape Town. They're not going to, that's not going to wash, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice try there, James. Okay. <laughs> okay, have a good weekend. Um, in Kenton, Kenton says, uh, Good morning, Griffillo and Chris. Please explain why, if I listen to Cape Talk by DSTV and radio, the broadcast is not in sync. There is a delay up to a minute or so. Well, p- part of the reason for this is because there's there's digital processing here. In the good old days of analogue radio, when you made some sound waves which came out of a person's mouth and went into a microphone, the microphone turns the sound pressure waves into electrical signals that go down the cable and they stay as those waves, changes in voltage, if you like, all the way out to the transmitter, which then transmits them in real time all the way out to your antenna and your antenna then gets an electrical voltage induced in it by those radio waves which mirrors the effect of of the sound going into the microphone and the sound is recreated at the other end and it's an end-to-end process but in these in this digital era we actually can mess around with what we do with the signals we record them or we send them down the microphone and then they can go through all kinds of processing and changes or they can be buffered up stretched compressed and all of this can introduce delays and In some cases, it can also be because they're going into space, going through a satellite and then coming back down to Earth. And the satellites that do this kind of thing are 36,000 kilometres out into space. So there's a delay because of that sort of thing. So all these things can actually introduce uh, delays. And so there's a processing delay, there's, there's intentional delay, and then there's distribution delay and then decoding delays. And this can all lead to a desyncing between different devices, all of which might be getting the information via different routes. It may have taken a different route to get to one output than another. Um, and so that's going to be obviously slower than the analog equivalent, where you literally just do end-to-end rapid throughput direct access broadcasting. Fantastic. In the midst of all of our celebrations about Apollo 11, here comes a bit of a controversial question. Uh, How likely is the theory that the moon is actually a chunk of planet Earth that was separated after a great impact? If so, why would it be round? Is there resistance and erosion in space? This is a terrific question. And um, Mm. what's been highlighted there is actually our prevailing theory of where our moon came from. We know from our analysis of rocks brought back by the Apollo mission and from elsewhere that the moon is about 4.57 billion years old. That's almost the same age as planet Earth. That means that the moon formed around the same time as planet Earth was first forming. First point. Mm -hmm. The second point is, um, well, why is the moon so large? Because if you look at other planets of Earth size like Mars, the moons of Mars, Phobos, Deimos, very small Why has Earth got a moon that's enormous? If you look at the chemicals that the moon's made of, they're also extremely similar to what the Earth is made of around its outer rim, its crust. Putting all this together, the current theory is that around about four and a half, five billion years ago, as the solar system was forming, because that's roughly how old our system of planets is, there were two planets, the early Earth and another one, which they notionally call Thea, and they ended up on collision course. And Thea slammed into the Earth and it ejected into space around the Earth this enormous shroud of crust material that the Earth was made of and some of the surface of this other planet. And the cores of the two planets merged. So you ended up with this hot molten Earth melted by this enormous collision with in space enshrouding this new bigger planet all this dust and over time, under the influence of gravity, in the same way that our, our planets formed from a big ring of dust around the early st- the star, the sun, this dust slowly accretes into a blob which we now call the moon. And the reason it looks round is because gravity is pulling through the centre of an object's mass. And the way in which you get as many particles as possible, as close together as possible, with as little space between them, so they're all attracting each other as much as they can, is to form a sphere. And so it's natural that you'll end up with a a thing that's roughly spherical, and that's why the planets are spherical, when they get big enough to be highly gravitationally active. So over millions of years after that uh, collision, the shroud of of dust and gas around the Earth caused by the collision slowly aggregated to make the moon that we have today. Fascinating stuff. I thought it was so... um 
such a question that was so left field, actually. Um, that's incredible. So then does that mean that we do have resistance and erosion in space? Well, the moon is being eroded, in inverted commas, a little bit by right. the radiation from the sun because it's a very intense environment up there. And as that radiation comes in, you've got a lot of energy being deposited into the surface of the moon. And this heats bits up, which then make them move a bit. So they're slowly rubbing against each other and eroding a little bit all the time. And that's why there's fine powder on the surface of the moon. Also, that fine powder would have been the last stuff to settle down. So Neil Armstrong's footprints and Buzz Aldrin's footprints really? are in that fine dust, some of which is being further eroded by by solar rays. But there's very little atmosphere up there. There's a tiny, tiny amount of gas around the moon. Um, there's not there's not going to be winds on the moon like there are on Earth to blow things around. Of course, there's no water now, except in ice. There's no liquid water Correct. to erode things. But there is certainly a little bit of solar erosion, I suppose you could say. Fascinating as always. And thanks to the anniversary of the 50th anniversary we're celebrating today, we get that granularity of detail. Dr. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, thank you so much for joining us on Upfront. Uh, looking forward to chatting to you when you're back in uh, in a couple of weeks. Indeed. See you in a bit. Have a good time. All right then. Bye-bye. Ciao.